Hello and welcome to another episode of Front Row. Joining me today is Vindya Ganeshan, who is the partner McKenzie and Company in Singapore. And we are absolutely excited to be talking to her on some thematic uh, questions here. Uh, Vindya, first of all, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having and, me. And uh, we'll just uh, uh, have a few questions for you on Front Row. And we'll start off with uh, uh, this very interesting disruptive versus sustaining innovation. So using the theory of a disruptive versus sustaining innovation, what disruptive innovation could we adopt in Sri Lanka versus what is hype? Right. So first to clarify definitions, what we mean really by disruptive versus sustaining innovations. Sustaining innovations are innovations that make incremental improvements to existing products and services to achieve outcomes that can be significant, right, on customer experience, on improving economic profit of businesses, etc. While on the other hand, disruptive innovations take out existing products and value pools to create completely new markets, completely new products, completely new value pools, which did not exist before. So that is the fundamental difference in definition. Talking now about disruptive innovation, McKinsey has an independent economic think tank called uh, MGI, McKinsey Global Institute, which came up with this seminal piece of work on our 12 disruptive uh, innovations, where we basically analyze hundreds of innovative technologies, disruptions around the world and said, what, how do we cut the wheat from the shaft, basically? What are the truly economically disruptive ones which will move the needle in terms of uplifting GDPs of economies, significantly changing economic profits of businesses, etc.? And that's how we came up with this list of 12. And that includes technologies like AI machine learning, it includes genomic processing, it includes autonomous vehicles, etc. If you look at that list and then apply a Sri Lanka lens to it and say what are Sri Lanka's biggest sectors that drive the bulk of our GDP today, you would say they are manufacturing, agriculture and tourism. And for those sectors, if you think about the disruptive technologies that could be truly needle moving, there would be, we would say about four. And these would include AI and machine learning, IoT, big data analytics, and the last one may come as a bit of a surprise, but blockchain, right? Let me give a couple of examples maybe to illustrate. If you think about IoT, IoT is said to be industry 4.0, is said to be to manufacturing what it was to lean in the previous, what lean was to manufacturing in the previous generation, right? So especially in a world with a lot of trade disputes where many companies are looking for attractive Asian destinations to re-domicile themselves, if Sri Lanka can significantly differentiate its manufacturing facilities in terms of being world-class versus some of our other South Asian neighbors, then IoT is something that is going to significantly help. Also because we do not have a ton of human resources, we're not a hugely populous country here in Sri Lanka, so to the extent that manufacturing processes can be automated and made efficient with technology, it is going to significantly help us. Right? So that's the, that's the case for IoT, if you will. If you were to take then big data and analytics and take agriculture as an example, precision agriculture, the whole notion of using data and analytics to determine on this particular square meter of land, if you've been growing potatoes, what is the next best crop to grow, right? In terms of crop rotation, at what point should you harvest in order to get the best yield and demand the best market prices, right? What kind of fertilizers should you be using, right? That kind of precision agriculture is known in several countries, including Morocco, etc. famously to significantly uplift farmers out of poverty by tripling their annual incomes etc. So precision agriculture, the use of big data and analytics there is another very uh, eminent use case for Sri Lanka if you will. The last one which I said I would shed some light on is blockchain which in most parts of the world honestly is to use your language hype, right? It does not translate into economic value. The reason I believe it could be pertinent for Sri Lanka is Sri Lanka could have a very unique promise in the region in terms of a competitive advantage in, for example, in apparel manufacturing, garments without guilt, right? Which could translate well into our agricultural produce where we give food safety promises, the organic promise. It could even translate into halal food, etc., where traceability becomes important and their blockchain plays a big role. So these to me would be examples of technologies that could be truly economically disruptive for Sri Lanka versus hype. Thank you for sharing those insights with us. And um, just again to move you on to, to touch the lives of uh, Sri Lanka at scale. 
uh, what are the one to two things we could do in the near term? Wow, that's a tough one. Um, okay, when you think about touching the lives of people at scale, social measures are the ones that come to mind first. But we like to think that you lead with economic growth and you lift people out of poverty and then you introduce social measures on the back of that. Let me explain a bit what we mean by that, right? So in terms of um, economic uh, initiatives, just an example would be if you look at what Malaysia has done with the digital free trade zone with Alibaba, why could we not imagine a situation where Sri Lanka would partner with a global e-commerce giant and help some of our SMEs in priority sectors like apparel, tea manufacturing, electronics, etc., to get priority access on those platforms on certain days of the month, right? That suddenly changes the access to market that these SMEs have, who have been serving primarily Sri Lanka, at best, maybe India, the region, to the world is their oyster, right? Suddenly it significantly improves market access. Not just that, but it also forces them to become globally competitive, to improve their operational processes, etc. over time. So it's a very virtuous cycle that it could, it could initiate, if you will. But not just providing market access, if you then couple that also with transforming the back-end logistics infrastructure, with doing network optimization for our trucks that go from Colombo to Hambantota as full trucks and then come back as half-empty trucks, for example, how could we use the power of digital? How could we use pick-me trucks, for example, to do cleverer network optimization so that we significantly improve the back-end logistics infrastructure? How could we help SMEs with things they struggle with, like freight forwarding, like last-mile delivery, or even cumbersome customs clearance, right? How do we digitalize that and make it a much simpler process for SMEs? So if it's thought about holistically and we come up with the concept of a holistic digital free trade zone that partners with a global e-commerce giant, provides market access to global markets and helps solve some of the back-end logistics issues, that could be game-changing as one example. Yet another would be uh, digital identity. Many countries around the world which have done well with digital government and digital economy initiatives are small countries like Singapore, Estonia, etc. because size in this case is an advantage. And Sri Lanka has that going for it compared to India, for example. And if India has implemented Aadhaar, nothing stops Sri Lanka from coming up with a universal digital identity solution because that then is an unlock to do many other things on the social front as well as the economic front. So for example, today a lot of money is spent towards welfare payments. What if we could translate those into conditional cash transfers, which has been done in many African countries, and the moment you have universal digital identity, you're suddenly able to track how much money is given to this farmer in this particular village, and also tie it then to outcomes that you care about. For example, is he using the right fertilizers? Is he implementing the right measures that are recommended by your precision agriculture recommendations, right? It could be whether the farmer's kids are turning up at school, school attendance, right? You could tie it to a whole bunch of education, uh, healthcare, etc., inputs and outputs, and make this a much more targeted uh, welfare payment, conditional cash transfer scheme that then really targets the people who are truly disadvantaged and move the needle in terms of lifting them out of their, their struggles. So those would be a couple of examples of how digital could touch the lives of people. people yeah. So we, we spoke about digital transformation, industries and technology advancements and then how it touches the lives of people. So how can we leverage technology to tra transform education in Sri Lanka? That's really important and that's a platform that uh, people do forget sometimes and we get caught up in the industrial revolution world. Yeah. That's very true and it's a topic very dear to my heart. So if you think about education, it's the whole gamut from early childhood to primary and secondary education to then technical and vocational education, higher education in universities and now about lifelong learning, right? Because learning doesn't really end with universities for the average millennial and honestly for all of us, right? So if you were to apply that lens and let's take primary and secondary education first, it's really about what I would call frugal innovation, which is no bombastic AR, VR, fancy technology, but if you could literally 
use the power of Khan Academy videos, right? You have very powerful Khan Academy videos on, for example, Newton's laws of motion, where you have the world's best professors lecturing on an important but difficult to teach concept like this. And you suddenly use these videos, beam them into the classrooms in remote rural Sri Lanka. You then lower the bar on what is required of a teacher and transforming capabilities of teachers in remote rural areas takes a generation of capability building. It's not something that can be achieved in the short to medium term. So you can short change that with, or leapfrog that with frugal innovations like Khan Academy videos, right? Yet another example would be Papua New Guinea famously used this thing called Project SMS, where essentially it's a very simple idea of sending two SMSs per day in terms of lesson plan nudges to teachers, right? So again, if you're teaching Newton's loss of motion, the idea is to send a just-in-time nudge to the teacher to say, today you're teaching Newton's first law, use this practical experiment in the class and that's going to be a game changer, right? So doing research into what would be the one or two game-changing lesson plan nudges that if teachers were to implement in the classroom, student outcomes would significantly improve. Then again, using frugal innovation, just simple SMS which can go to feature phones, you do not need massive bandwidth or smartphones in order to be able to do that. Those kinds of things would be the huge unlock at the primary, secondary school level, right? Also, there are many SLASCOM reports that talk about the gap between the number of STEM graduates that Sri Lanka produces, almost saying that we need, I think we have about 7,000 STEM graduates coming out of Sri Lanka every year. And even to fulfill our domestic ICT needs alone, let alone being able to export anything on the ICT front, we need almost twice that number, right? So how are we going to produce those graduates? I think two things to think about. One, interventions need to come at a systemic early stage level, so emphasizing the importance of STEM education right from the primary secondary school level including digital literacy, coding, design thinking etc early on in the curriculum which many countries are doing is inevitable and we need to start doing that but also for the again that takes a generation right to produce graduates who are now just about starting digital literacy in the primary school level but also what could you do with our arts graduates many of whom are unemployed or underemployed can we put them through short sharp four-month boot camps that are focused on an employability perspective where you teach them skills like iOS app development, right? Or it could be design thinking, right? Where you teach them targeted skills that make them employable and you do this in conjunction with employers so that when they come out, they, they are immediately employed, right? These would be ways of significantly improving the levels of digital literacy. Now, there are next-gen things that you can think about in higher education where you use the power of AI to say if, if a particular student is scoring certain grades in mathematics and physics, then this is not the major that they should be pursuing and they should do a course switch after the end of year one. And that significantly has helped improve uh, completion rates, etc. in the US. Those are next generation things that we could think about, but I think there's a lot of fixing the basics uh, that we could already do in Sri Lanka. Vindya, thank you very much for sharing uh, your experiences, insights and shedding some light uh, of what we can do in Sri Lanka for some quick wins as well. So thank you very much for joining us on Front Row. My pleasure. Thank you.